Hello. So this is a video lecture uh, about eye diseases. So first and foremost, anytime someone calls the vet clinic asking about um, something wrong with their animal's eye, the best thing to do is to get them seen as soon as possible. So we do consider anything involving the eye a bit of an emergency. Uh, the reason for that is um, with animals, they can develop something called a melting ulcer and um, it can really quickly progress to the point where the animal loses uh, sight altogether and sometimes needs to have the eye removed altogether. Uh, so it's always a good idea to get those eye conditions seen ASAP as soon as we can get them in. So first we're gonna talk about clinical signs that'll show up with an eye illness. Uh, so first of all, uh, we're gonna see signs of pain. So in the eye, that's gonna look like probably tearing up. Um, so excessive tearing is also called epiphora. You'll see squinting of the eyes, the nictitating membrane protrudes. That's that third eyelid, right? So uh, like this guy, this guy there. Um, they might be pawing or rubbing at their eyes. They might be holding their eyes closed. Um, if it's a dog, they could be whining and they could show sensitivity to light. Those are all signs of pain. Um, it could be just one eye, especially if there's like a physical injury to the eye. It could be both eyes. Um, so either way, we do want to see those right away. Uh, another just general sign of pain is an animal um, with less energy uh, and that doesn't want to eat. Um, both energy levels and eating uh, are affected by pain. Uh, so another thing we might see is just discharge. Uh, so there could be discharge with signs of pain or discharge without signs of pain. Um, there are three different types that you can see. Uh, a clear fluid discharge, discharge is called a serous discharge. Uh, there could be, if there's mucus in it, um, you know, really mucusy, it'll be mucoid. And if it is um, green or yellow, that's purulent. So remember, purulent means um, uh, having pus. So again, there could be various amounts. It could be a single eye or both eyes affected. So if it's one eye, it's unilateral. If it's both eyes, it's bilateral. Uh, typically, if we see that purulent yellow or green discharge, that usually indicates there's some kind of infection. Um, and then there's just a little note here that, that, you know, the kind of eye crusties or I call them eye goobers, those are pretty normal in dogs and cats. Uh, same with humans, right? Those can just be cleared away without, um, without being a sign of illness. It's just dried, like kind of tear fluids. Uh, so if there's any cloudiness of the eye, we're concerned about eye illness. Uh, so it could be um, the cornea that's cloudy. So remember the cornea is the outermost portion of the eye um, and that's called corneal edema. It could be the lens which is uh, cloudy. Um, so that could be lenticular sclerosis or cataracts. Uh, it could also be the anterior chamber that's cloudy and that's called uveitis. Um, so the anterior chamber, if you remember, is the frontmost portion of the eye that uh, contains the aqueous humor. Uh, so corneal edema, this is a nice little picture of it. Uh, it looks kind of blue. Uh, you can see that with uveitis, uh, which is the inflammation in the eye. Uh, you'll see that with glaucoma. You'll see that with um, lipid buildups in the cornea. You can see that with trauma. Lenticular sclerosis can be uh, fairly normal with age. It's, um, the lens just becomes overly cloudy. So you remember the lens is kind of um, like it's in between the anterior chamber of the eye and the vitreous chamber of the eye. Um, and that is the part that focuses light onto the back of the eye. Um, as animals age, that can become just kind of cloudy and scarred. It makes it difficult to see through. Um, or sorry, it doesn't make it difficult to see through, sorry. Um, but it, uh, it just, they just look older, right? They just have that old look to their eyes. So there's a difference between that and cataracts. They kind of look similar, but cataracts, you can't see through, whereas the lenticular sclerosis, they can. Um, so if you have, or sorry, if they have cataracts, it's a buildup of protein in the lens. 
Um, we'll see that often with, as they get older, they can develop cataracts. It could be a congenital thing. Um, it is fairly common with diabetes, especially in dogs. Um, that is something that I will always discuss with dog owners that are, um, have a recently diagnosed diabetic is that cataracts are a possibility because what happens is that glucose starts to build up in the eye. Um, so if there are, sorry, they can be mature or immature. If they are mature, we can do surgery to remove the cataracts. Um, I'm not sure what the status is in Calgary in terms of people doing eye surgeries there. Uh, but in Winnipeg, um, as far as I know, there isn't anyone doing cataract surgery in Winnipeg. You have to refer that out to, um, one of the major hospitals. So near us, it's either Guelph, uh, like the University of Guelph Vet Hospital there, or the, um, Western College of Veterinary Medicine in Saskatoon. <sighs> so, yeah, <laughs> there's some cataracts, nice and cloudy. Uh, so uveitis, uh, that's a really painful condition where the anterior chamber of the eye is uh, really inflamed. Um, so there's, you know, kind of swelling in there. We'll see that corneal edema. Uveitis can be caused by lots of things. Um, so eye trauma will cause it. There's some cancers that can cause it, metabolic changes, um, autoimmune diseases, infections, or problems with the lens. Uh, so depending what causes it is going to indicate how it's treated, right? Um, so uh, one of the suggestions here is atropine. Atropine is something that will help to uh, drain some of the fluid excess buildup in the eye. Uh, we're also probably going to want to do pain medications because it is a painful, tr uh, painful condition. And if we have antibiotics on board, if it's an infection, that's going to help with that. Uh, so typically uveitis is going to be treated with eye drops and uh, systemic medications as well. So like an oral medication. Uh, another symptom we might see with the eye is pressure changes within the eye. So it might feel harder or softer. Um, so if we feel changes in there, it's going to indicate disease of the inner eye. Okay. So glaucoma, which is an increased pressure, the eye is going to feel hard and the pupil is going to look dilated. Um, or the other option is uveitis where you will see a soft or you'll feel a soft eye and the pupil will appear small. So we, uh, talk about taking eye pressures. Um, usually it's called a tonometry. Tonometry is measured with a tono pen, a tono vet, or um, a shots tonometer. So um, the, this guy here is a tono pen. Um, I really like the uh, tono vet. It's just like these little puffs of air. This here is a is a shots tonometry. It's um, you have to pr you have to like hold this thing onto the eye, and then it acts like a scale. It like it depending on the softness of the eye, it will move the scale. Um, so if we're going to do anything involving the eye like this, we need to make sure that we have anesthetized the eye. So we use these little eye drops that are called alkane. Alkane needs to be kept in the refrigerator. Uh, so if you are doing, um, you know, an eye pressure test, you're going to need to get the alkane out of the refrigerator and put a couple drops in the eye. It just freezes the eye. Uh, with a local anesthetic and it prevents the dog from like, or the cat from blinking. Um, they kind of lose those uh, eye reflexes. And there's the picture of the alkane bottle. So if an animal has glaucoma, it means that they have a high eye pressure. It's higher than normal. So the eye is going to feel hard. Um, there isn't really a cure for glaucoma. There sometimes we'll try to regulate like blood pressure and things like that to try to help with glaucoma. More often than not though, the animal ends up with compromised eyesight and we end up doing surgery to remove the eye. Uh, for your interest, I have posted a video in um, our Brightspace classroom today with a, um, eye removal surgery. It's called an enucleation. I personally find enucleations difficult to watch. I love surgery and usually I have no problem watching things, but for some reason watching eye surgery really bothers me. So I usually just uh, pay really close attention to my anesthetic monitoring and don't really watch surgery when I'm sitting in on those. Uh, so uveitis, we kind of talked about this as a symptom already or a sign, uh, but it's going to be inflammation within that eye and it causes a soft, a soft eye. So low pressure. Um, 
we talked about this already, it could be caused by infection, things like diabetes, um, high blood pressure, uh, toxicities, it could be immune related trauma or lens damage, etc. So we'll probably see that the eye is red and cloudy with um, that swelling or edema. Uh, there could be bleeding or tearing and the eye definitely feels soft. So usually um, uh, the inter, so IOP is intraocular pressure. So intra meaning within and ocular is referring to the eyes. So it's the within the eye pressure is going to be low. So glaucoma and uveitis can look really similar which is why we need to take that eye pressure so that we know which one we're dealing with. Um, and then of course, we're gonna treat the underlying causes. We kind of talked about that already. So it's not just the eye globe itself or the eyeball, uh, the eyelids can have problems as well. So those you're gonna see things like swelling around the eye, there might be crusting on the eye, the eye will appear itchy um, or red, and there might be growths on the eyelids as well. So blepharitis, uh, blef, uh, blepha is um, uh, the word part for the eyelids. Um, so uh, blepharitis would be inflammation then of the eyelids. So when you have inflammation anywhere, you're gonna see redness, swelling, uh, pain or itching, and usually some discharge as well. Uh, and you can see those right on there, redness, swelling, itching, squinting and blinking, and possibly discharge and crusting. So if there is blepharitis, we not want to treat the underlying cause. If it's an infection, we're gonna use antibiotics. We can use anti-inflammatories to bring down the inflammation. And uh, we wanna give some pain medication as well. Anything with the eye is painful. We should be giving pain medication to all the animals coming in with eye things. I mean, think about it. If you have an eyelash in your eye, how uncomfortable are you? Never mind if you have um, like an illness in your eye, right? Knock on wood, I've always been very fortunate to never have an issue with my eyes. And I'm very glad and grateful for that because it does seem pretty miserable. Um, if there's like a growth on the eye that can potentially be removed. Um, and if the eyes are really inflamed due to like an allergy situation, uh, we could look at doing a diet change as well. So there's a list of things that could cause um, irritation or blepharitis of the, uh, of the eyelids. So allergies, trauma, injury, infections, skin disorders. So mange, mange is um, like a parasitic skin condition. So caused usually by mites, uh, if there's a dermatitis and inflammation of the skin. And it could be caused by hormonal illnesses as well, hypothyroidism, Cushing, and diabetes. We'll talk about all three of those when we talk about endocrine system illnesses. And if there are growths in the eyelids, um, we that can cause the blepharitis as well, and we might need to remove those because any kind of growth in the eye area is really irritating to the eye. Uh, usually if we do remove a growth, we're gonna wanna send it away for testing. Um, I'm sure you guys remember reading about that in the skin um, condition section. Um, the, if we send it away for histopathology, which is um, the study of diseased tissues, we can determine if it is benign, which means not cancerous, uh, or cancerous or malignant. So if we see, oh, the, these ones are upsetting to look at. I apologize for these pictures. I didn't put them in, but I'm still apologizing. So um, if we see a bulging or a sunken eye, so not sitting normally in the eye socket, um, we are certainly concerned. So if it is bulging, it could be because of glaucoma. Uh, so the interocular pressure is a lot higher with glaucoma. So it makes the eye appear like it's kind of bulging right out of the head. Um, we could also have a proptosis, which means that the eye has come completely out of the socket. Uh, and that's what is being shown here. These are both uh, proptosis or proptoses. Um, those are usually caused by some kind of trauma. Um, like the ones that I've seen have all been hit by a car related. Um, 
however, be aware that there are, um, like, animals, like, this, I'm not surprised this Shih Tzu has a, like, look at his normal eye, it looks like it's bulging out, right? Um, like, honestly, there isn't all that much difference between those two eyes. This one is prop toes, this one's normal. Whereas this guy's prop toes versus normal is really different, right? Um... So anyway, uh, it, can, it is more likely to happen in brachycephalic dogs because their orbit isn't as significant um, a structure as a, I guess, dolico or mesocephalic dog. Um, so it's more likely that um, their eyes will uh, pop out or prop toes. Um, so other reasons, it could be that there's a tumor behind the eye, an abscess or a hematoma behind the eye. So remember an abscess is like a pocket of infection and pus. A hematoma is like a bundle of blood, basically. Um, if we see sunken eyes, that's often going to be because of dehydration. Um, it's really common when you see those old cats for their eyes to look really sunken. Um, if there is trauma, though, where the eye has collapsed, it'll appear sunken as well. Um, so some notes on proptosis here. Um, you can't, okay, it is possible to replace the eye in the socket and suture it in place. Um, and then you're going to give them a lot of drugs to help them with that. Lots of pain, lots of, lots of pain drugs, lots of anti-inflammatories. Um, and then after, uh, you know, a good two or weeks or so, we'll remove those sutures and hopefully the eye has healed in place then. Um, it's possible for them to regain sight, especially if you catch it early. Uh, but the longer that the eye's been out of place, the more likely it is to be damaged or dried out. Um, and the more likely it is that the animal's gonna remain blind in that eye. Uh, if it is if it is pretty badly damaged, we're going to look at just removing the eye as opposed to trying to replace it in. Uh, so tumors, abscesses, and hematomas behind the eye um, push the eye forward. So you need to try to deal with that. You could try to remove the tumor, drain it if it's an abscess or a hematoma. Um, these are going to be a little bit of a tricky situation to try to treat. And then if you have sunken eyes due to dehydration, we just need to rehydrate the animal. Uh, if it is a collapsed eye, um, honestly, we're probably gonna look at removing it. Oops, I'm scrolling the wrong way here. So uh, another clinical sign we might see is a wound in the eye. So anytime there's a s suspicion of a eye wound, we wanna see that as soon as possible for sure. Like all of these are emergencies. Uh, but wounds especially, like I said, can turn into melting ulcers. Um, and melting ulcers can uh, progress really, really quickly. So uh, wounds to the eye are going to look like an eye puncture, uh, a foreign body or something stuck in the eye, or um, an ulcer, an ulceration, which is like um, damage to the cornea, like a scratch. So again, these are going to vary in severity depending on what's causing the issue. Usually they're going to be like uh, trauma of some type. So um, the wounds to the eye are, um, any guesses? Any guesses what causes the most that I see in clinic anyway, wounds to the eye? It is dogs hanging their heads out the window while driving. And then someone kicks up some gravel while they're driving past and it goes right into the dog's eye. Maybe you drive too close to a tree branch and it whips the dog in the eye. So many things start with dog and head out the window. So um, I never recommend people let their dogs do that because they're really likely to get injured. Or if they're going to do it, get them those doggles. Because not only does it keep them safe, they are so stinking cute. <laughs> I love doggles. Anyway, off topic. So, um, so if there's uh, something in the eye, like a foreign body, it might be, um, especially if it's like a penetrating foreign body, it's going to be difficult to remove. Um, that we're going to get them into clinic for that. Like don't advise someone at home, try to remove that. Um, it says may require sedation or anesthetic. I would say usually requires sedation and anesthetic to treat. Um, so uh, there's lots of different ways to treat these. Um, you know, I don't know why we're even getting into treatments too much here because we're going to talk about treatments a little bit later on. 
but I've seen some really cool approaches using contact lenses, which is really interesting. So um, that I think is a is a cool a cool treatment. Um, and so if you have ulcers in the eye, sometimes you need to debride the ulcer, which means um, basically the doctor takes a little needle and like scratches over the eye. It seems really counterintuitive that scratching a scratch would help it to heal, but um, often we see really good results with that too. It's really interesting. I, I work with a doctor that um, has an interest in eye, eye issues like this, and it's uh, very, very interesting watching her work. Okay, so um, we might see pigments on the cornea. Um, so the cornea, again, if you remember, is the very outside portion of the eye. It's the part that if you touch your eye right now, you are touching. Um, so we're not talking about pigment in like the iris. That's normal. That's the colored part of the eye. Um, but sometimes you'll see stuff on the outermost part. It looks like stuff floating on top of the eye. Um, sometimes we'll, it'll be scars. So if there's some kind of injury or trauma to the eye, there might be a white scar tissue that stays and remains in that area. Um, if they are uh, present, they do uh, obstruct vision to some degree. Um, and usually we're gonna see these kind of things after pretty severe injuries. Uh, so blood vessels on the eye, they look like little red lines. Um, I think they kind of look like a spider web. Uh, they're basically just like new blood vessels on the cornea, so it can help with healing. Um, there are, oh, I can't remember the name of the condition. I've only met one Doberman with it, but it's common in Dobermans, um, and they get, uh, it looks like a web of like red, uh, um, like blood vessels over their eyes like that. Uh, that's an interesting one. I've only ever seen it once though. Uh, okay, so tumors in the eye, again, could be benign or malignant. Um, but regardless, they're going to damage the eye in some way and could damage vision as well. So uh, sometimes the tumors originate in the eye, sometimes they spread to the eye uh, from other places. Typically it's difficult to remove a tumor that's within the eye. You're just probably going to do enucleation and remove the entire eye. Um, so lipid deposits, lipids are fats. Um, if there's lipid deposits in the eye, you can sometimes see that as well. I don't know if we have a picture. Nope, no picture on that one. Um, you could try to treat the underlying cause, but usually it doesn't really cause problems and there's not really much treatment you can do for it. Okay, so redness in the eye, and this is a great example. Um, that is something that we are concerned about with eye problems as well. So we wanna distinguish if the redness is around the eye. So is it the eyelids? Is it the conjunctiva? So remember the conjunctiva is kind of continuous with the cornea and like goes into like the insides of the eyelids. Um, that uh, causes conjunctivitis. Uh, so conjunctivitis is like pink eye, if you've ever had pink eye. Um, or it could be the eye itself that is red. So the sclera, which is the whites of the eyes, um, there could be blood in the anterior chamber, so like the front part of the eye that contains the aqueous humor, that watery fluid, and the cornea itself could be red as well. So we talked about blepharitis before, so I'm just going to skip past that one. Uh, conjunctivitis, um, that's like pink eye, right? Um, it could be, um, usually it's like some kind of infection in the eye. It could be associated with allergies. It could be, um, um, shoot, I lost my train of thought on that. Um, oh, uh, it could just be associated with um, um, like a viral illness as well. Um, so lots of time caused by infection or trauma for um, if it, the whites of the eye, the sclera is red. If there's blood in the anterior chamber, that's usually some kind of trauma or a sign of a bleeding disorder. Again, I'm not getting really into treatment in here. And if the cornea is red, it could be keratitis, which is inflammation of the cornea. And then um, the last clinical sign we're going to talk about is blindness. So blindness is a little bit difficult to assess in dogs because we can't ask them to read a chart with letters on it. We can't ask them how many fingers we're holding up. Uh, so we have to do um, some kind of a little bit subjective testing. 
Um, <laughs> and if it's only one eye that's affected, it can be really difficult to tell how much, um, how much blindness is, is affecting them. Uh, so there's lots of different levels here that it can be um, at. So it could be that the cornea, you know, is maybe like scarred over. Uh, the anterior chamber, the lens has issues that they can't see through. Um, it could be that the retina has a problem. The retina is the part of the eye that takes in the light and translates it into information to send to the brain. If the optic nerve is damaged, it's not carrying that information to the brain. It could be that the brain is damaged and isn't making sense of the optic information that's coming in. So fortunately for dog owners, um, Blind dogs usually do really well. Um, you just need to be careful with how you um, handle them. So uh, if you're doing things like um, moving around your furniture and stuff, you're going to really kind of spook the dog a little bit. So let them kind of get used to their surroundings and do things um, like slowly, okay? Uh, okay. So diagnostic techniques or ways that we can tell what is going on with the eye. So th things that we're gonna do, um, well, the doctor's gonna do to make that diagnosis. So first of all, they're gonna just do a straight up ocular exam. So they're gonna look at the eyes. Um, they're probably gonna use an ophthalmoscope. So ophthalm meaning the eyes and scope is an instrument to examine. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, make sure your ophthalmoscope is fully charged. <laughs> um, we just plug ours in every single night to make sure that they have a good strong battery every day. Um, so anyways, we examine the dog usually in the dark. They're going to check things to see um, if uh, they can see through the eye, um, to detect if there's anything wrong with like the conjunctiva, the cornea the lens, the anterior chamber, um, they're gonna look right to the back and see that retina. Um, they're gonna check things like uh, the third eyelid membrane, make sure that looks nice and healthy, all the areas around the eye as well. Uh, so, um, that, that's using the ophthalmoscope. Um, we can do a fundic exam, which is uh, examining the retina. Um, so in that case, we usually need to dilate the eye. So we're gonna use atropine drops to dilate the pupil. Uh, and then the doctor can look right to the back and see that retina. Um, and then there's different, like in the ophthalmoscope, there's different lenses. I don't think you really need to know that though. And there's an example of atropine drops. Another test we can do is called the Schirmer tear test. This measures tear production. So it's this little, they look like this, right? Before you put them in, you dip it into the eye and basically it just like by capillary action soaks up the amount of tears. Um, so uh, normal tear production is gonna bring it right up to here. If we see that it's dry or a little low like that, we're gonna be concerned about dry eye issues. Uh, so dry eye issues could be autoimmune based um, it could be due to breed, uh, it could be due to diseases or medications. Um, so that's going to give us information about whether or not the animal is producing adequate amount of tears. Uh, we don't need to freeze the eye for this one. It's a little bit irritating to the animal, but it's not um, bad enough that they're like pawing at it. Typically, if you just give them a nice bear hug while you're holding them, they'll hang out with that thing hanging out of their eye for that full minute. Whoa. Sorry, knocked over my really professional box setup for this uh, lecture. Uh, okay, so our next uh, test, are we gonna have pictures? Okay, is the fluorescein dye test. Uh, so the fluorescein dye test is like a little liquid that looks like highlighter. Basically, the doctor drops some of that fluid into the eye and then flushes the eye out with saline. Um, they're going to absorb some of that with like Kleenex or gauze. Um, and then, um, and then look at the eye with, um, like a blue light or a purple light. So this test, what it does is it detects corneal ulcers. So the fluorescein is a dye that does not get uptaken into the cornea unless there is a scratch. The scratch in the cornea absorbs the dye. And then when you flash the light in there, it fluoresces. So you can see it nice and shiny and bright. Um, 
like that. That's a really great example. So you can see it, there's damage to the cornea there. We might not be able to see that otherwise, but we put the dye in there and it absorbs into the injury. So do you guys remember talking? Oh, yeah, no, we did. Um, talking about the nasolacrimal duct. So if you remember, tears from the eye drain into the naso, or I mean the lacrimal um, puncta, and then the canal and the duct, etc. And then it goes into the nasolacrimal duct. So that drains into the nose. So we can also use this test to see if those nasolacrimal ducts are patent, which means opened. Um, oh, I thought we had another picture of the uh, nose dripping the stuff. Uh, but often the nose will drip that yellow highlighter fluid out of the, out of the nose after. Um, sometimes doctors are bad at telling the owner about that. So if you get the panicked phone call, you can say, oh, that's normal. It's just from the dye test. So we talked about measuring pressures already. This is a tono pet. I don't know. I think that's a tono pet. Oh, it's a tono pen. Um, and then this is the, uh, the shots tonimetry. Um, basically we're going to use topical anesthetic there and then measure with those two devices. There's, I really like the, the tono vet cause that one just kind of blows a little puff of air on the eye. It's really cool. Um, so we can use this topical anesthetic will allow for tonometry. Um, and if we need to do treatments on the eye, this will help as well. It prevents, the, well, it doesn't prevent, I guess it, it helps the animal to stop squinting. It takes away some of the pain in the eye. So, um, it's a little bit easier to examine a painful eye if we've used the local anesthetic. Uh, if we're suspecting an infection, we could swab the eye. We want to use a sterile swab for that. Uh, and then we can either do the cytology in house, which means make a slide, stain it and look for bacteria, or we could send it to a lab for a culture and sensitivity. Uh, a culture and sensitivity is um, basically a culture means we're trying to grow the bacteria from the sample. And then if anything does grow, they're going to isolate it and determine what organism it is and what uh, the sensitivity is what antibiotics will kill it. So that way you can use the, uh, the drug that's best for that specific infection. So we've talked about clinical signs. We've talked about how we're going to diagnose. Now we can talk about some treatment options. So uh, often our go-to with eye things is topical medications. So these are drops or ointments that go directly uh, on top of the eye. Uh, lots of them do need refrigeration um, and that's fine to do. Um, we want to make sure when we are using them that we do not contaminate the tip of the bottle or the tube because it is possible, um, like if we touch the eye with the tip of the bottle, it is possible for bacteria to grow in the bottle and could cause problems. So we want to make sure we are not contaminating it. Um, we want to make sure, oh geez, look at all these notes here. It's essential to know if they contain steroids, okay? Um, and then we mustn't mix up with ear meds and owners will need instructions on use. I don't know how you would mix them up with ear meds. They're pretty different. Um, but uh, owners do need instructions on how to give them. Um, I, we will talk about this and uh, I'll do some demos for you on how to do uh, eye medications. Um, basically, we just wanna hold that eye open and drop the drops right onto that eye. Or if we're doing a, an ointment, um, I kind of fold down the lower eye and put a, the ointment right into the eye that way. So drops and ointments are for surface of eye things. So um, uh, oral and systemic medications aren't going to get into the cornea uh, because there is a barrier there. So we need to have those topical medications to be able to treat the outside of the eye because systemic drugs aren't gonna get there. Um, so, oh, that's funny. It says drops slash ointments are drops or an ointment. Okay, <laughs> so drops are liquid. Uh, ointments are like kind of oily, they're oil based. And if they do require refrigeration, make sure you put a little sticker on the label tell, reminding the owners of that. Uh, we want to make sure that um, we are not damaging the eye by touching it with the bottle. And we're making sure that we're not contaminating the bottle by touching it with the eye or touching the eye with it. 
Um, so there are uh, times that we do not want to use steroids in the eye and that's why it's important to know if the drug you're using has a steroid. Lots of eye medications have multiple drugs in them. So it's important for the doctor to know when they're prescribing which one they're going to use. We don't want to use steroids if they have an ulcer or really bad infection in the eye because it's going to interfere with healing. So we want to, you know, be careful about that. So that's funny. Eye and ear meds are often both in small bottles. Eye medications, it's fine if they go in the ear, but you can't put ear medications in the eye. So anyways, um, I think just be really clear with owners what is what and label it. Draw a picture of an eye on it if you need to, to make it really clear to them. Uh, and then you're going to have to show owners about restraint, how to get them into the eye. Eye medications are often really frequent. So I've seen some go home where it's every four hours. That's pretty frequent. Um, I personally have never seen a conjunctival injection. Uh, it does say here that it's uncommon, but could be used for severe problems. I've never seen that, but to be fair, really extreme cases we refer out. So um, it could be that those are happening at those facilities. So systemic medications are going to be either oral medications, which the owner can give at home, or injectable uh, medications that we can give in the clinic. Often we're going to do a little bit of both, a systemic medication and a topical. Um, like we said, the systemic ones are going to treat more of the back of the eye, but the front of the eye needs that uh, topical to be effective. Um, so systemic medications take longer to work uh, because um, they take longer to absorb into the body, right? What a topical medication, you put that on, it's on, it's there, it's right where it needs to be. A systemic medication needs to be absorbed into the body, it needs to be um, transported to where it needs to go, and then it can start to have an effect. So it's a slower, um, you know, response time, I guess. Um, I'm just looking here for, yeah, so injectable, if we have a severe infection or illness, we might be hospitalizing pets as well. Again, I haven't seen injectable treatments for the eyes. Uh, okay, so antibiotics, that is, um, so these like systemic medications and topical medications could come in the following things, right? <coughs> So antibiotics, they kill bacterias, or if you have like an antifungal, it kills fungals or uh, fungal infections. If you have an antiviral, it's attacking viruses. So antibiotics are attacking bacteria. The problem though with systemic uh, antibiotics is that it doesn't really differentiate which um, bacteria it kills. It just kills anything it comes in contact with. So that means that sometimes we might see problems like diarrhea or vomiting with antibiotics because it is um, killing off all the good bacteria in the colon and the gut as well. Uh, so often if we're sending home systemic antibiotics or oral medications like that, we wanna send home some kind of probiotic as well uh, because that'll usually help um, the animal to feel the most comfortable. Um, it's that's common in humans as well. I've heard so many times where people are on an antibiotic and then they end up with like a yeast infection because uh, it upsets the normal um, bacteria flora in the vagina, right? So that's fairly common, I find. Uh, you hear stories about that a lot. Uh, so topical antibiotics um, are a lot better, especially if you are dealing with things on the outside of the eye. So like conjunctivitis or uh, like blepharitis. Um, if the cornea has some kind of issue that needs uh, antibiotics, the topical is going to be the way to go because it's going to treat them right where it needs to be. Um, and a bonus, topical medications have less side effects than a systemic drug. So if you use an antibiotic in the eye that's like topical, you don't really have to worry about that whole probiotic wiping out the gut bacteria thing. Um, so it says needed for bacterial infections or to prevent bacterial infections. Um, yeah, side effects, basically that vomiting diarrhea is going to be um, one of the bigger issues with systemic drugs. Um, 
I don't know. All of these are just basic drug stuff, which we'll talk about when we talk about dispensing drugs. So anti-inflammatory medications, um, they are anti against inflammatory is referring to inflammation, right? So they bring down inflammation. So there's two types that we can use. Uh, there's two types of drugs that bring down inflammation. One is an NSAID. That's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. It reduces inflammation, which thereby reduces pain. Um, so an NSAID, an example of an NSAID that humans take would be like Advil um, or, um, uh, I'm trying to think of other ones, like ibuprofen is Advil. Um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of other ones. I can think of all these like dog ones, but I'm trying to think of some to give you guys an example. Um, so they're basically like, you know, the things you would take if you have a headache. Um, we could also uh, do steroids as well. Steroids bring down inflammation, but steroids can also prolong healing. So it's kind of like a balancing act to choose if that's a good choice or not. So the doctor will make the best choice for the specific patient. Um, and we don't want to use NSAIDs and steroids together. So steroids can be used for anti-inflammatory. Um, if we're using them long-term, especially systemic steroids, we need to taper off the drug. Uh, that's because we can cause, um, um, <laughs> we can cause a, like Addison's disease. So we'll talk about these in, in the endocrine section, but like Cushing's is um, really high amounts of steroid in the body and Addison's is low. When we're giving an animal steroids, we cause the um, adrenal glands, which create the steroids, to um, kind of go dormant. So if we just stop providing it, then all of a sudden we could have an Addisonian crisis, which is um, a problem when they don't have enough steroids. Uh, one thing that we need to be aware of with steroids is that typically it makes dogs and cats thirsty and hungry um, and it makes them pee more then since they're drinking more. So we need to be aware of that as a side effect to inform the owners. Um, I'm just kind of scanning here if there's anything else I really want to highlight for you here. Um, people, okay, I think this is a good point to make here. Topical steroids should never be used unless the eye has been examined. And there's no evidence of an ulcer, ulcer, viral, or fungal infection, as steroids will make all of those worse. So, if an owner calls you and says, Hi, uh, so my dog had any, uh, like an eye thing a while ago. You guys had sent me home with some eye drops. And I don't know, his eye seems to be really bothering him now. That was like probably like four or five months ago. Is it okay if I just use those drops again? Your answer should be no, I think we should get it examined and make sure that it isn't something new or different. Um, there are some drugs that when we use them in some situations might make the issue worse. So we don't wanna just go ahead and use that drug. If that drug will be the best thing to treat, we can certainly you know, just charge you for the exam and you can use the stuff you already have. But if he does need something different, we wanna do the best thing for your pet, right? So that's something to be aware of. Uh, so there's topical or systemic steroids. Um, you could combine those with an antibiotic if needed. Uh, I don't know. I'm just kind of trolling here. And then they have some uh, examples of ones that have different uh, um, steroid in the drug. So lots of these are mixes like BNPH. I think that's like four different drugs are in BNPH. And here's just some examples or pictures of the drug. So atropine, atropine is a drug that dilates pupils. That's it, I guess. Um, dogs will be sensitive to light if their pupils are dilated. Um, and sometimes it, it the drop tastes bad. So um, as you know, tears can drain into the nose, but if that nose stuff gets into the mouth, it could taste bad. And then they might start kind of like foaming a little bit because of the bad taste. So that would be a normal response if, um, if someone calls you in a panic about that. Cyclosporine is a drug that suppresses immune responses. Um, so we could use that in some situations. Uh, it's not great though, um, because it could, because uh, it's suppressing the immune response, they're more likely to get secondary infections. So it's really uh, specific situations that we're gonna use the cyclosporine. And then of course we have surgical options as well. 
Uh, we could do eyelid surgeries, we could remove tumors, we could remove the entire eye globe with an enucleation surgery. We could do surgery on the cornea, like I talked about doing that um, cor uh, corneal abrasion, or um, sorry, corneal ulcer, shoot, what is the word I'm looking for here? Debridement, there we go, corneal ulcer debridement. Um, there's cataract surgeries. Um, all those are gonna be done under general anesthetic. Uh, I suppose it would be possible to do sedation and local, um, but most cases we're just gonna do general. Eye instruments are really specific and they're all teeny teeny tiny. They're really kind of adorable. Um, enucleation to remove the eye, it says as a last resort. Um, I think it depends on the situation. Most people, yeah, aren't itching to get their eyes, their dog's eyes removed. Um, so typically they will try some treatments first, but there are some situations where enucleation is just the best thing. Um, usually after surgery, they're gonna require eye drops to keep the eyes nice and lubricated and healthy while everything's healing up there. Um, some doctors might use um, sutures that are absorbable in the eye. Um, if they have to have the sutures removed, they're probably gonna need sedation or anesthetic to do that as well. Um, and I will tell you right now, learn from my mistake. When I was a really new tech, we did an eye surgery on a dog and I put them in the kennel after surgery and I did not put an e-collar on the dog right away because they were waking up from surgery. And then the dog woke up from surgery and scratched open his uh, eye sutures. And we had to anesthetize the dog and put the sutures back in. That was really terrible and I still feel awful about that. So anytime an animal is having an eye surgery, have an e-collar ready to go. When they're waking up, go ahead and put that e-collar on them. Um, they don't know what they're doing when they wake up from anesthetic and the first thing they're gonna do is try to rub that eye and they're gonna rip out the stitches. So um, my recommendation is just get that e-collar on right away and learn from my mistake and don't let that happen to you because that was awful. I still feel really bad about that. Uh, so here's just a picture of surgery going on with those tiny little instruments. So uh, we can talk about specific conditions now. So we've talked about signs we might see. We've talked about how we can diagnose eye conditions. We've talked about various treatments. So let's talk about specific conditions and then how we would diagnose slash treat those. So uh, for a proptosed eye or a dislocated eye, this is absolutely an emergency. The sooner we can get them treated, the less likely they are going to result in blindness. Um, if it is possible to replace the eye, we will do that. If we can't replace the eye, we're going to have to remove the eye. So if we can get that going as soon as possible, we might be able to treat it better. Otherwise, we'll just remove it. If we can pop it back in, we're going to suture the eyelids closed to hold the eye in place until like, you know, the muscles and ligaments and tissues all around their heel. Um, and then we're also going to give the animal anti-inflammatories to bring down the swelling and it'll help with pain. I'm sure you can imagine that would be a really painful. Uh, blepharitis, I feel like we already talked this one to death. It's inflammation of the eyelids from lots of different causes. Probably we're gonna use a topical medication. Um, it's gonna reduce the inflammation in the eye, treat infection if needed, and go from there. Um, it's not usually gonna require surgery unless it was like blepharitis because of like a tumor or something. So foreign bodies in the eye are very painful. If it's just on the surface, um, we can probably remove it. Uh, if it's penetrated through the cornea, it's gonna be a little bit trickier to treat. Um, usually we always wanna check for ulcers if there has been a foreign body in the eye because it's possible that it's damaged the eye now. Um, you can do a conjunctival graft to protect the eye and help healing. Um, uh, one of my doctors does this all the time. It's like they'll sew up basically that third eyelid to kind of keep everything protected and, um, and uh, let that eye heal up. Um, if it's really bad, uh, we might need to remove the eye. 
Um, burns. So if there's like chemical burns or like liquids, fumes, etc. into the eye, we want to uh, flush it really well and then treat whatever ulcers there might be there. Um, so it could be medically treated with medications. It might need to be surgically treated, like if we need to do a graft or something to help the healing. An entropian, um, that's what this is trying to picture here, I think, for you. Um, but an entropian is basically this lower eyelid rolls in and then like the hairs and the skin on there are rubbing on the cornea. So like the conjunctiva is like a mucous membrane, right? Um, the out, that's the inside of your eyelid. So like if you pull down your eyelid in the mirror and you look, it's all that like the red stuff underneath the eye or uh, eyelid, I mean. But like the outside of your eye is just straight, straight up skin and eyelashes. Um, and that really can do a lot of damage to the eye. Um, so that can be common in certain breeds. Sorry, I don't know, my furnace is making a funny noise. Um, so there are breed dispositions like Sharpies and Chows we'll see it a fair bit in. Um, so and a really bad entropian, like this one looks like it's causing damage to the eye. You can see there's like dye uptake there. Um, that's probably going to need to do some surgery. Um, so we're going to remove extra skin to reduce the inversion, uh, but we can only do that once the animal is fully grown. We don't want to do it when they're a puppy. We have to wait till they're all grown up. So we want to, uh, it's just basically like taking a little, a little wedge out of the eye to help it to roll out properly. Uh, and then ectropian, so entro, uh, that's meaning like in, right? Ecto, that's meaning out. So ectropian is a condition where the eyelids are rolling out. So you'll see those really saggy, droopy eyes. So common in like your hound dogs, your spaniels, um, uh, St. Bernard's, I've seen it in basically every St. Bernard I've ever met. Um, so dogs like this, uh, it's possible for them to get a lot more conjunctivitis because just environmental junk ends up in their eyes way more often. Um, it could result in eye irritation uh, or less tears. So that's not a great thing because then the eye is more likely to get damaged. If that is the case, we can correct it with surgery. So again, we just take out some of that extra to make that eyelid a little bit tighter. Uh, growths on the eyelid, these little things, they're little kind of warty guys, really common. You see those a lot in dogs. Um, if it's just hanging out and not bothering the eye, it doesn't need to be removed. But if it's rubbing on the cornea and causing discomfort, we're probably going to want to just remove that. Um, so it's just a little surgical, uh, surgical procedure. They just take like a little V-shaped wedge out, like a little pizza, and then sew it back up. If we have um, <clears throat> third eyelid is showing, right? If it's like pulling up like this, that also called the nictitating membrane. Um, we're gonna see that if the animal is sedated, uh, it starts to roll up. If they're sick, um, or if they have a shrunken or painful eye, those third eyelids will show up. Um, sometimes we'll see, do we talk about it here? Yes, cherry eye. So sometimes that um, at the back of the, at the back of the nictitating membrane is a gland. Um, and if that gland prolapses, do we have a picture? Yeah, there we go, cherry eye. It looks like a little cherry sticking out of their eyes. That's why it's called that. If that gland prolapses, it's sticking out. Um, it causes that whole thing to, to hang outside of the eye. Um, so that can lead to dry eye, which again is really uncomfortable for the animal and it does make them more likely to have injured eyes. Um, so basically we can um, replace that surgically. So a cherry eye surgery. Um, usually it's pretty effective, but it, there is a possibility for that cherry eye to come back. This is a really bad conjunctivitis, holy God. Oh, that poor animal. Um, so conjunctivitis is inflammation of the conjunctiva, right? That's the inner layer of the eyelids. It's also called pink eye. I'm sure you guys have either had pink eye yourself or known someone with it. It's fairly common in schools. I think especially high school and especially among females if they share their makeup. Um, so if it's unilateral, which means just one side, it could be because of a foreign body or an eyelash situation. If it's bilateral, both eyes, it's probably related to allergies or a systemic illness. 
So exam will kind of help to tip you off about what's causing it. Um, we're going to probably just treat it topically, treat the source of the infection and then monitor it. If it's something like a growth or an eyelash, etc., we're going to check for ulcers as well and then treat whatever the cause is. And I think this might be our, oh no, we have two more, I think. Okay, so dry eye, uh, it's called KCS. It's Carato Conjunctivitis Sica. So Carato is referring to the uh, cornea. And then the conjunctive is referring to the con conjunctiva. And then itis is inflammation of. And sica means dry. So this is one situation where the medical term con Carato conjunctivitis sica, dry eye is way easier to say. Um, but basically what's happening there is that there's not enough tear production. Um, it's often autoimmune related because the body's attacking the tear glands. So in that case, that's where using that cyclosporine might be a great idea because we can reduce some of that immuno, um, immune response in the eye. So you can use that immuno responsive response sorry, immunosuppressive drug. Um, using artificial tears will help to uh, help with the dryness in the eye as well. Um, if an animal has that Corrado conjunctivitis sica, uh, it's likely going to be on medication for life. Um, so this is a, like a chronic illness. Um, oh, here's a little uh, Shermer tear test showing us that it's a low tear production. Here's some uh, just like artificial tears. I'm assuming this is cyclosporine. I'm not sure on that one. Um, is this last one? Oh my God, it just keeps going. Uh, so Epiphora, I'm sure you guys have seen this um, with dogs that have um, like, let's say pugs or Shih Tzus or Maltese cats uh, like Himalayans or Persians, uh, epiphora is really common. So it's when tears are overflowing from the eyes and then running down the face. So they usually have staining around their eyes. It's really noticeable in white dogs. So like Maltese or little poodles, like white poodles, you'll see it a lot. Uh, it stains it kind of a reddish brown color. So it could be because of too many tears being produced. Um, so things like, uh, caused by like allergies, pain, foreign bodies, I, whatever, the whole list there. Um, or that the tears aren't draining properly. So, um, if there's a blocked tear duct, uh, it could be causing epiphora as well. So certain breeds, it is really common. So any brachycephalic breed, um, tears just have a harder time getting into that nasal lacrimal duct. Um, so, uh, if it isn't, a brachycephalic animal, um, one thing we can try to do is flush the duct to see if we can get it uh, more patent or open so that the tears can drain properly. So if this is an animal that hasn't had this problem before and now it's causing a problem, um, doing that flush can, can certainly help. If it is like a brachycephalic dog, um, you might just need to try to use um, like wipes to clean up the uh, skin around the eye and the hair around the eye um, and just kind of keep on top of that to keep the area looking clean. So Epiphora isn't really necessarily a problem. Um, it just kind of doesn't look the nicest. Um, but if there is a problem with drainage, it could cause some pain. Um, if it is a tear overproduction, you could look for and treat underlying causes and we don't bother getting into more detail than that. Usually people just clean it up with wipes and go along their day. Because if it's not causing a problem for the animal and you just think it looks uh, ugly, I don't know why you'd really pursue a ton of treatment. So a nasal lacrimal occlusion can cause that epiphora. We can diagnose that with a fluorescein eye stain. This is the picture I was thinking of, of, this, of the dye coming out of the nose. So that can cause or show us um, if there is a blockage in there. Um, so corneal ulcers, that's like some kind of scratch or damage to the outside of the eye, the surface of the cornea. So it is possible, like I said, for a corneal ulcer to develop into a melting ulcer, which just kills the entire eye. Uh, so we want to treat these right away. Um, we want immediate attention because we don't want that eye rupturing. 
So if we have a really uh, bad corneal ulcer, we might need to cover it with a third eyelid flap. We could use a contact lens. We might need to, like I said, debride. So you're scraping or roughing up the surface of the cornea to stimulate the healing. So that's where we're like rubbing a little, um, like a needle over the eye. You uh, will be using eye drops um, and usually systemic pain medications and antibiotics. We're not gonna use steroids with an ulcer. Um, so bulgy eyes, brachycephalic animals are especially predisposed to injury. Same with dogs hanging their heads out of the car. Some simple ulcers, especially if they're superficial, might heal really quickly. Uh, if it's really deep, that's probably when we're gonna need to do um, like one of those eye flap surgeries or the contact lens thing, um, or maybe possibly enucleate the eye. So again, no steroids, even systemic steroids don't do. So deep ulcers could need surgery. Uh, so debriding, grafting, using glue. Oh, and I think this is actually really cool. Um, so you can use the pet's own blood to treat uh, deep ulcers, which is really interesting. Um, so you can like pull blood samples and then spin down the blood and then we remove all the um like clotting factors and the blood cells and we're just left with like the fluid part portion of the blood and we can use that as an eye drop in the eye um, and it can um help to reduce the progression of a deep ulcer it's really interesting i uh saw that for, that was one of the first um treatments i saw uh working in um I used to work at the Humane Society, like, I, well, I volunteered there, and um, and that was one of the first treatments I saw in their clinic, and I was just so fascinated, and I was like, I think I might love vet medicine, and now here we are. <laughs> ah, so keratitis, kerat is again referring to the cornea, itis is the inflammation of. That's going to cause that cornea to look really cloudy and opaque, which means you can't see through it, um, so this could cause some blindness. It could be caused by an ulcer or an infection. BV growth, I'm trying to think. Oh, blood vessel growth um, in response to an ulcer and injury. Uh, and then panis is an autoimmune disease that causes a similar look. Um, cataracts in the eye, geez, I thought we were almost done, but I guess not. I need to just look at these pages here, 21 out of 23. So cataracts, that's that loss of transparency in the lens. So it could be, um, especially if they're young, just an acquired situation, um, so genetic. Um, if um, they have diabetes, you're more likely to see uh, cataracts. Uh, could, could just happen with age as well. Um, it is possible to remove the lens and replace it, but that is a referral surgery. Um, nuclear or lenticular sclerosis, um, that often looks like cataracts, but it's just old age, old dog eyes. Uh, basically the lens just gets more fibrous and that causes that kind of color change and cloudiness to the eye. It doesn't affect vision uh, and no treatment is needed. It's usually noted in the file because then we know that in the past they've had that. Um, so if we're looking for like when cataracts started, we know that this is a reference point. Oh my God, I feel like we have talked uveitis to death here. It's an inflammation of the inner part of the eye very painful, um, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not getting more into that one. I feel like we talked about it a hundred times. So glaucoma, remember, is that increased intraocular pressure. Um, so that can certainly lead to blindness. Usually what we're going to end up doing is um, surgery. There are some medications that can help drain fluids from the eyes, uh, but more likely than not, eventually we're gonna just remove the eye. This is our last one, retinal disease. Um, retinal diseases are genetic based. Um, apparently a collies are especially bad. Um, lots of cat breeds have eye issues, their eyes should be tested. Um, but anyways, there is screening offered for breeding animals through the Canine Eye Registry Foundation. Um, so if they are, if you have a person that's planning on breeding um, their animal and they have one of the at-risk breeds, it's a good idea to have them certified before breeding so that um, we're not contributing or passing on uh, uh, that retinal disease. 
okay? And that is it. That's the entirety of our eye notes. So lots of really uh, gory photos in here, I think. I don't know, maybe it's just me. I'm not that um, into like eye surgeries and gross eye stuff, but. Um, so I encourage you to read, or sorry, read. Um, I mean, you can certainly read these notes too. Um, you can watch that video of the eye enucleation. I think it's a really interesting video. I'll also post some videos about how to place eye drops into the eye um, so that you can uh, learn about that as well. Um, I think ultimately the real big takeaways we want to remember here is that any eye thing, get them in that same day if you can as soon as possible. We want to consider any eye issue an emergency. Um, we do want to see them right away. And I always just tell people about molting ulcers and that scares them into coming. Like if they're like kind of leery about it, oh, I don't know. I mean, maybe I can just wait and see. I'll say, okay, uh, I just want to warn you though, it is possible for animals to develop something called a melting ulcer. It can progress really quickly and basically the eye just kind of collapses in on itself and does need to be removed. And then they're like, oh my, well, maybe I should get them in. So I really try hard to encourage people to come in right away. And then if there is an eye problem, we want to have an e-collar on so that the animal isn't scratching and rubbing at their eye and making it worse. All right, so if you do have any questions after this lecture, please do make sure to make a note of them and ask. I'm available in the daily chat, I'm available via email, and I'm in the virtual classroom with you. So you're always welcome to ask me questions in any of those places. So that's everything I have to say about eye illnesses. If you uh, do have any questions, make sure you ask and thank you for listening to this lecture.